experience, their career, just quickly, um, or as long as you want, I don't care. And then, and, then, uh, and then I'll just kind of throw questions. We don't need to do like a format where I'm throwing questions and we go down the line. I'd love for this to be a debate and everything because we really kind of want to get into what happens in a writer's room. So Liz, just a little bit about you know, your journey. Um, I got started on Dawson's Creek with <laughs> Rena. Um, when I first graduated from college, I was an assistant and I kind of wrote a freelance script that was terrible, but it was, you know, a good experience. And, um, and after that became an assistant on American Dreams eventually. And I think that's where, oh, thanks, oh, thanks. Um, and then that's where I kind of started working my way up as a writer. And, um, I created a show called Life Unexpected. <laughs> I'm very nice. That's really sweet. Um, and, and then I kind of worked on a bunch of ABC, kind of was in the ABC drama world for a long time and eventually um, uh, for three seasons was an executive producer on the show Casual and um, that kind of, I don't know, was just a really great experience. So anyway, um, kind of moved into comedy-ish, drama and comedy obviously super blended. So um, um, now I'm working on the morning show with Apple, I'm working on adapting a book called Little Fires Everywhere um, by Celeste Ng for Hulu for a limited series and just doing a couple other pilots that could be alive or dead at any moment, who knows. <laughs> uh, my name is Chris Rogers and uh, I come out of magazines. I started the Atlantic Monthly uh, and I worked for Condé Nast for a number of years. Uh, and then got into TV with uh, my brilliant partner Chris Cantwell and we had a show called Halt and Catch Fire, which was on for, uh, thank you. Uh, that was on for four years. We wrapped it up last year. Um, I have a movie about uh, the founding of ESPN that, that's going into production this year and, and we'll hopefully be back with something new on AMC next year. Uh, Sean Ryan, um, I also started off on Nash Bridges like Glenn, where we got to know each other. Uh, I went and worked on uh, Angel for a year with Joss Whedon, and then um, <laughs> go wait to see which of my shows no one claps at, by the way. <laughs> because there are some shows that were criminally underwatched, and I don't want to hear you guys clapping at Terriers. <laughs> yeah, where were you then? Where were you in 2010? Um, so I went from uh, Angel to Making the Shield, where I brought Glenn uh, over um, and did that for seven years. Did the, the unit with David Mamet at CBS, and then Terrier, Chicago Code, uh, Last Resort, Mad Dogs. Um, and then now, for the last year, have been running or co-running two different shows, uh, SWAT on CBS and Timeless on NBC. <laughs> And uh, that's me. So you're, you're an overachiever, basically. <laughs> I'm making up for the five years that no one would hire me when I first moved out to Los Angeles. Hi. So, yeah, I was started with, on the creek with, with Liz. And then I stayed in the WB for a long time. I did Everwood for four years. Yay! I knew that one was going to get the love. With Greg Berlanti. That's going to get the love. Um, and I went on to Gilmore Girls, and then, yeah, WB. It was the, the, the best of times. Um, and then I went and I did Privilege. That was my own show for the, that was actually for the CW. And then, yeah, much like Liz sort of followed and then jumped over to ABC for a while, I did Mistresses for four years. Thank you. No one ever claps for Mistresses, and it was on for so long. Thank you. And it wasn't... I know, it wasn't as hoary as the title implied. It was really feminist, but no one would ever believe that. So I live with the shame of, of Mistresses, the title. Uh, and then I did Red Band Society, and, which was really fun and crazy, and jumped over to the catch and got a little Shondaland action, and now I'm uh, parked at CBS for a while, which is fun. Um, and I started out as a writer's PA for Dick Wolf. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing for Dick Wolf. Um, uh, and then after that, I was a, a writer's assistant on Everwood for two seasons, where I got to work with Rena and got my first uh, couple scripts there. And after that, I was staffed on a show called Summerland. For oh, yeah! <laughs> um, and then after that, I created uh, and ran Greek for four seasons. <laughs> You. Um, and then after that, I uh, went from fraternities to cancer with Chasing Life. So it's a seamless transition of subject matter, but that's, that's me. 
Okay, great. So, so there's an incredible amount of experience of people working in different rooms, comedy, drama, mostly drama from what I'm hearing. So let's just talk about what is the role of the writer's room? Okay, how do you see your position when you're on a staff? How do you see what the staff's position is when you're a showrunner? And and what how, you know it's a, a, a you know and we all know that the the writers room is basically a collection of writing a writing staff everyone sitting around the table you're working out ideas you know but but how do you how do as a showrunner how do you use that and as a staff writer and there may be people in the room who want to be on staff what's the job they're going for how do you explain that I mean I always think of it as like it's getting a bunch of really smart talented people to help me do my homework. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the writer's room, I, I think, is one of the most magical parts of the whole process that it works, and that it, it's usually a group of people sitting around a table eating too many snacks and kind of going, well, it could be this, or what if it's this, or what if it's this? And the, the only real way to, to land on the thing is someone will say something that kind of strikes an emotional chord, and everyone will go, oh, like that, that, you know, like, and you know it. Uh, and the fact that that actually works over and over again, I, I think, surprised me the most. Uh, but it's it's the nuclear reactor core of a show. If the writer's room is dysfunctional, if it's not turning out scripts, quality scripts on time, uh, mm -hmm. then, then nothing else works. So, so, I, so I really think it's, you know, it's, it's the beating heart of, of any television show. I, I would add that every writer's room is different, mm -hmm. too. Uh, that there's a different dynamic and a different expectation in each room. We start off in Nash Bridges. We were just doing the panel. That was a very intense, no writer is ever allowed to leave the room from 10 a.m. till 7 p.m. Lunch is going to get brought in, and you just crank out the stories, and scripts are written afterwards or on weekends. A writer's room on a Joss Whedon show was very different. It was kind of looser. You would do some work on your own. You would sort of come. There, there weren't many of us. There were only like four or five of us on Angel at that time, and you're always waiting for Joss to show up uh, to kind of, you know, because he had two shows and, and development going on, and so it was just kind of trying to have something for, you know, for him to sign off on or to critique or everything. You know, I, I took things I learned from Nash and things I t took from Angel and applied my own rules to my own writer's room, you know, when I was in charge. And, and so these things are very different. But yes, you're... You know, I sort of view it as, you know, who's the showrunner? What do they want? And so my job when I was a staff writer was to come up with the ideas and write the scripts as closely as my boss would if he or she had the time to do it. Um, but they don't because they have too much to do. So your job is to try to get into the head of the person uh, who's running the show and try to service their vision. Uh, hopefully they have enough leeway to accept some of your vision and make it part of their vision uh, as well. I never want somebody that's only trying to think like me in the writer's room. I'm trying to get somebody who is going to make me think of my own show differently and in better ways. Um, and then the other thing I'd say about the writer's room is I always describe my writer's rooms as being a complete and utter democracy and what I meant by that is that everyone's voice is heard and every opinion is sort of equally valued. So it's a complete and utter democracy until that moment that I decide it's a complete dictatorship. <laughs> so all the ideas, all the ideas, it doesn't matter what your level on the show is, you know, you speak up, you hear it, and then at some point somebody, whether it's me, whether it's a person running the room in my absence, whoever, somebody, there's gotta be a final decision maker that says, okay, we've had the debate, we're not doing this, we're gonna do that. And then everybody's gotta get on board and say, okay, what's the best way of doing that? So, so it's a democratic collaboration to try to work out the story, but really to kind of fit the vision of the showrunner. So the, so the showrunner is the real power in the writer's room. That's what we're saying, right? And is that always true on every show? Because there are shows in which you have other powerful forces. You have big actors, you have studios who may have different opinions of what the show is. Increasingly have, there's IP and so maybe it's, your show's based on a book and that author's right. got some opinions. So you, you may have a network has a different vision, you may have um, um, non-writing producers. This is something we don't really talk about but a lot of times you have non-writing producers, a lot of them came over from film when the film industry contracted and they started you know, attaching to IP or talent so they may be a level of executive producers. So you know, how does that 
you know, so you do have a lot and uh, a lot of different forces. So what have been your experiences on different shows that maybe you have, you know, clearly Joss Whedon's a person who has a clear vision of a show. Greg Berlanti is a clear, you know, and, and, and powerful guys who are not going to get pushback. Have you worked on shows in which it's been, you know, a little more up for grabs or a little more difficult and, and, uh, and maybe the power structure is not as clear? I just throw that out to anybody. Well, for instance, on Casual, that, that's a, that was a situation where I got brought in as an experienced showrunner to work with Xander Lehman, who created the show, but didn't have much television experience. He was, he is an amazing writer, very, like, incredibly, incredibly capable, but they wanted a, an experienced person to kind of do it with him. So in that dynamic, as the showrunner, I didn't feel like I necessarily had a final say because I'm sitting there with the person who created the show and you kind of craft your job around that dynamic. So on Casual, um, I felt like my job was to do two things, to teach Xander how to, you know, to, to teach him all the tools that I could to help him run his own show, which he's more than capable of, and to support his vision to really understand what his vision was for the show, what stories he's trying to tell, and then to help him do that kind of as well as possible. Again, he was an incredibly capable person. Um, so at the end of the day, I think, um, I think the show is really his vision, but of course, as you're collaborating with someone in that way, the show, kind of to what you're saying, like can't help but expand to include your vision too. So like when I watched that show or just having the experience of running the writer's room, I, I still got the benefit of like putting all that shit I care about, you know, onto the show too. And when I watch it, I'm like, oh, it feels so satisfying. But at the end of the day, I mean, that, that was his show. Um, and I think that, that that collaboration in terms of a power structure, you know, like I said, we had a great collaboration, but certainly I've been in a position of having, you know, somebody paired with me. Um, I've worked for people and seen those collaborations go wonderfully, and I've seen them go really badly. Um, and so that's where I think the dynamic can become trickier. If you might have a, you might have a creator who's not quite capable of running their show yet, and you might have a showrunner who really kind of wants to take the power away. And when they start having friction and you don't know who to listen to, then it starts to get tricky. And you know, best case scenario, writer's room is like, I always think of like cheers and I'm like, oh, it's kind of like sitting around the bar and like someone's running with scissors and it gets a little crazy and you're like a little drunk, but then it's like good. But like that can go bad fast too. <laughs> and it's like, I mean, on American Dreams, that was one of the most fun writer's room I've ever been in. But like, I mean, there would be things that I'm like, what just happened? And it's only like 10, 12 AM. Like we've only been here for 12 minutes. Someone has like thrown water on someone. Someone's like, called somebody a horrible name, someone else has stormed out, tripped over something, then couldn't really leave on that awkward storm out and had to like <laughs> circle back. Like someone's crying and you're like, and then like half the room's having sex with each other too. So you're like, what's happening? Um, wow, but, I've not had a writer's room like that. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. Actually, that's it. untrue. Two of our writers on The Shield met and got married, so. Well, no, but, but. Uh, well, and that was Kurt, like a wholesome family show. Kurt, Kurt and I almost had a fist fight in a room once, and then we hugged it out, so that was okay. <laughs> there was another time I walked out of the Shield writer's room, and I walked into my office. I was so mad. I was like, why am I in my office? I don't want to be here. So I got, off, I got in my car. I drove off, you know, got Starbucks or whatever, came back, and then I, I said to uh, Kurt and Scott Rosenbaum and some other writers, I was like, hey, I'm really sorry. I stormed out. And they were like, oh, where'd you go? We didn't... <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I couldn't even be dramatic. <laughs> um, what, what about on Halt and Catch Fire? So you were a new showrunner yeah. and, and did not have TV experience there, right? Yeah, I mean... So, I, so what was the... You know, how'd you succeed? I mean, well, terrific I, I, show. I how'd think you, you succeed? alluded to it. I mean, I, I was fortunate to kind of study at, uh, at the feet of an assigned showrunner, this guy named John Lisko, uh, who is kind of a veteran of ER. He kind of runs the John Wells offense. Uh, I, I think you'll find people descend from different shows. Obviously, Nash Bridges was this great kind of farm system for amazing writers. Uh, and so this guy, John Lisko, really kind of taught us everything we know, but not how the arranged marriage of a showrunner and a show creator works. Uh, you know, 
like it or not, the showrunner is there to protect the network's investment to a certain extent, make sure there's a TV show there. Uh, you wrote a good script, you had an interesting idea, but there's no guarantee you're gonna get to continue with the thing if you can't be part of the group, if you can't learn to be in a writer's room. And so uh, my writing partner and I, when we began on Catch Fire, we'd never been in a writer's room. Um, and the learning curve, the great learning curve of it, honestly, is, is just to learn to, you know, Everyone has to feel very safe uh, to bomb over and over again in a writer's room, to, to keep throwing out ideas until you find the right one. And, and that means not attaching to your ideas and <laughs> you know having that be your self-worth. Uh, you can disagree with my idea and think my idea is wrong for the show. That doesn't mean you think I'm wrong for the show. Uh, so I think that's usually the emotional learning curve of, of a new uh, writer. And, and after two years of that, we you know had positioned ourselves to be showrunners. So it was, you know, I'm, I'm grateful because I think the show wouldn't have made it past infancy if we'd been handed it right off the bat. Well, like, uh, go ahead. Yeah, just calling it an arranged marriage, for me it was like an arranged honeymoon because you're kind of, it's so intimate and personal and you're making yourself vulnerable. You're like, can I put my hand, no, okay, that's, how is this, no, okay, we're not gonna do that. And it's just, you know, we're sensitive artist type people and, you know, it's, it, it, it's really, it's, it's charged when you're in it and you want to be respectful, but it's also scary. So it's, it, there's a lot of emotion underneath that power. I, I would add to your original question, there are a lot of external forces that can affect a TV show. And one of the jobs of the showrunner is to kind of shield the writer's room mm -hmm. from as much of that as possible so that they can do their work and focus on the scripts from which nothing else on the show can be done without the scripts. As I always say, not to, you know, um, not to feel sorry for ourselves, but I say the writers on a show are the only people that are doing something from scratch. Everyone else is interpreting something, almost always the script. You know, The actors have a script to work off, the directors, the set designers, everyone else. And so, yeah, while I may be getting flack from the network or studio, or my star may be freaking out, or any number of things might be happening, my writers are probably aware of that going on, but I try to make it clear that's not your problem. Your problem is the next episode that we're breaking, and just make that as good as it can be, and I'm gonna try to shield you from that, so you know, a good showrunner, I think, uh, will put his or her writers in a position to succeed like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Rena, what what about the different hierarchies within the writers' room? Like, what happens when people are breaking story, and you know, you may have the co-EP as the highest person under the showrunner, and they stink, and they have really bad ideas. <laughs> and they're yeah. taking you down a road that you don't want to go down, or maybe there could be a power dynamic within a room that splits the room into factions. You know, whether or not you've, you've had those experiences yourself, or I would imagine I it's Hollywood, you've, <laughs> you've heard of it. You know, what about that? Like, what, what kind of effect does that have on the creativity, the creative process, and also the morale of the writers? I think I, I very much agree with, with what Sean said in terms of if you, if the showrunner comes in and sort of presents, starts off the room with there's no ego here and every idea is valid and every idea can be great and every idea can suck, including mine, then everyone feels, then it really does become may the best, may the best person win. And when I was, I had my arranged marriage for mistresses, the show you guys all hate. <laughs> um, <laughs> they don't hate it, they just didn't watch okay. it. It's okay, I'm over it, it's fine. It was a summer series, you can watch it on Hulu, and we'll talk about it next year. But well, uh, that was an arranged marriage. I had run shows prior to coming in, I, but was paired up with KJ Steinberg, who hadn't run a show yet. And she was great, she was better than me in that she was very much like, how are we gonna do this? What are the rules gonna be? And I'm not a very confrontational person, so I'm like, oh, I'm so, I don't, know. I don't know, I think. She's like, well, someone has to win. And it was, a, it was a smart way to phrase it because I didn't, it didn't occur to me that way and I said, oh, you don't have to worry, the room's gonna win. Like the room will eventually reveal itself in terms of like what, if we do it right, if we make everyone feel, if we make everyone feel like we're in a bad marriage and these are our kids and their parents are getting a divorce all the time and it sucks, then it's gonna be a shitty room. But if we sort of go in as a loving married couple and tell our children that we love them all equally, <laughs> then at the end of the day, if we can't figure it out, if you, if you and I are the last two people who are still disagreeing, then we leave the room. 
and we duke it out outside, but the same thing. I think that the idea in, is to always protect your staff, is to never have your staff feel like they have any stress other than to come up with great ideas. I mean, that really, because at the end of the day, there aren't, other than one room I was in, which was maybe the most dysfunctional, where the showrunner just had all of us on all the notes calls all the time, <laughs> which was a super power play on his part to like fuck with the studio and network and make them uncomfortable, and it worked, but it was so terrible and uncomfortable <laughs> for all of us. <laughs> but the idea is the writers should never be thinking about anything but story, and anything else, it, then you've, then I think we've made a mistake somewhere. And then hopefully, again, you take it outside, you course correct, and you come back in with no ego. So, so I'm hearing that, you know, it's really the showrunner's job, not just to provide the vision, but also to run block and protect the writers and to set the tone. Okay, so one of the things I learned from, from Sean is, you know, on the first day of, of The Shield, the new season, you would always kind of address the, the staff, and, and that's something I do, and I always kind of, you know, um, uh, try to set the tone, you know, and I, one of the things I want is I want the room to be as free and as creative and as loose as possible, and that requires discussing explicit material, discussing sexual and violent material, but also we want to be respectful to each other, and we really want to, you know, so I always say, you can say anything you want about a character or something about a story, but if you're disrespectful to somebody else in the room, you know, you need to, you know, then we have a problem, okay? So I set that, and I haven't had any problems in my room. What are some of the things that you do as showrunners to set that tone to establish a power dynamic where people feel safe, people feel open, but, you know, how, how do you handle it? And then as the season comes up, as issues come up, how do you, you know, who do you lean on? How do you delegate? How do you, how do you handle conflicts that will come up and yet you want to set a tone and kind of walk that line between being creatively free but also being respectful. I'd say the first thing you just lead by example. Yeah. Right? If you know, they're gonna follow your lead. If 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 in the first day of work you're kind of making, you know, crude jokes, you know, about women or sexuality or you're making ethnic jokes, you know, people are gonna think, well, oh, well that's how this you know, that's how this room runs, right? So, you know, another thing I try to do very early on in front of the group is I try to make fun of myself um, to sort of show that it's okay, to show that I'm not infallible. Um, I encourage people to please speak up if they think I'm leading the show astray with an idea. Um, you know, you guys on The Shield, you know, were we always did. very we good. That. Yeah about telling me, hey, Sean, you know, we've been discussing this while you're out of the room and you're really wrong about this. I think it was more like, Sean, you were fucking up the show. What are you doing? <laughs> that's, that's how we said it. Something yeah. like that. Um, so, yeah, you, you, you set by example. And, and, if, and if you're clear, you know, it also really begins in the hiring process. Right, the yeah, writers that you bring in, you're gonna, that. you know, we all talk amongst each other, mm -hmm. right? And if you've been an asshole on some other show and now you're interviewing for me, there's a good chance I'm gonna hear about that and probably not hire you. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you're putting together a staff that you feel is gonna be respectful and supportive of each other, um, and you know, you know, trying to work together on behalf of the show. And if you get the right people in there, you're gonna avoid the problems. Um, I think it also, you know, it also helps to have, I believe, uh, a diverse staff. And diverse can mean any number of things. It can be gender diverse. It, 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 it can be racially diverse. It can be geographically diverse. It can just be diverse of thought. But, but people, you know, but I find that you get into problems when there's a herd mentality. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's a bunch of people who sort of all think this way, then the one or two people that are different can kind of get you know, sort of picked on in some ways, but if everyone's sort of unique amongst the group, it doesn't go like that. So you try to set an example, and, and if the boss says, you know, we're not gonna insult each other in the room, I think people tend not to. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right that also, because you can get into a room where, you're where you find out you didn't know and you're hired as a staff writer, and it turns out your boss is an asshole and says horrible, <laughs> horrible things, and it is sort of, it's a, it's a tough moment, but I think it's actually less about being a writer and more about being a human, because you can lean in and hop on the train 
because it's easy, but then you are that, remember, because someone in that room was hurt by you or offended by you, even though you aren't, even if your thought process was, well, I had to, because he wasn't gonna listen to me if I didn't like say shit about chicks all the time, and it's like, well, now I don't wanna hire you. Like, so it is, it's just about being true to who you are. That's where it You also have no that. idea who's gonna be your boss five years from now. Mm -hmm. I just learned a week ago, a, a woman that worked as an assistant on Last Resort, which was only seven, you know, seven years ago, she's got her own show on Netflix starting. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh my God, good for her. You know, uh, I'm, I'm, you know five years from now, I'm gonna be trying to get a job from her. It's, you know, crazy. Um, Okay, so there's a lot coming up. So let's talk a little bit about the hiring process. So how do, how do you consider your staff and putting together a room that's going to be um, inclusive, but also, you know, what kind of power dynamics are you looking for that? You're looking for higher ups experience, you're looking to break in people, or like, what, how do you staff your rooms? And, and what kind of support do you get from agencies, studios, and networks if you have a particular room in mind? Anyone? Well, um, you know, I think that I think that it's I think that it's changed a lot in a good way. I think we're thinking about things that maybe ten years ago we weren't thinking about as much. Mm -hmm. um, like what? And I mean, diversity is a huge thing, and, and like you're saying, diversity in every way. Um, I think that you know I'm staff I'm staffing Little Fires right now, and you know one thing that I've really wanted to do, and that I hadn't really scrutinized before. A lot of times in staffing in the past, like with Life Unexpected, for instance, I, you know, I read everybody, I met with them, and then I tried, I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't as, I, I just wasn't as aware. I was thinking like, what scripts do I connect to? Who did I connect to in the room? Um, and then who are people that are going to complement each other? Like everyone has strengths and weaknesses, and how do I make sure that I'm not hiring everybody with like the same weaknesses or the same strengths? And I was thinking about it kind of more like that. Now, obviously, I'm thinking about it in a much deeper way that I think I just wasn't thinking about before. Um, Have you with, ever? Oh, go ahead. Well, sorry. with Little Fires, for instance, that book is very specific. And um, we also have Reese Witherspoon and Carrie Washington attached, which which in the book, Carrie Washington's character wasn't indicated, she wasn't specified as a certain race, but obviously now she will be. And so in putting together the room, what I've really tried to do, which I've never really done before, I admit, um, is that I'm really looking at what the book is about, um, I'm looking at who the book is about, and then I'm really trying to get specific about what voices will really lift that material up. Um, and who, you know, and, and who really needs to be represented in this room and, and in a, not in a, not in a token way of like, oh, I checked a box, but in like a deeply, deeply substantial way of like, um, I'm not going to hire the staff writer who has the least power and kind of check this box. I'm talking about like co-EPs shaping the show and it's just a much more thoughtful approach than I think I'd had in the past, and I mean, I'm embarrassed to kind of say, I'm not embarrassed to say the part about Little Fires that makes me happy, but I think I'm, I think I'm embarrassed that I was maybe as, when I thought I was being thoughtful, was much more thoughtless than okay, so I let, realized. So, so let me ask, so when you're talking about co-EPs, you're talking about bringing in a, either a woman or a person of color at, in a leadership position to sort of run the room in your absence. Or so not, yeah, or not, or, yeah, or about? not even. I mean, I plan to be in the room the whole time, but, but what but if I'm. you get called out or something. Sure, and, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, definitely to 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 do anything in my absence, but also to really be creative collaborators. You know, this book in particular deals with a lot about race and class, um, African American culture and Asian American culture and Asian immigrants, um, and so it's so important to me that that there are upper level voices who can speak with authority, experience. The book has a lot to do with um, adoption. I, I'm adopted, but I want other adopted people. I want people who've had different, experience with it, different experiences with adoption. I just, I just want to round it out in, in a full way. The book is about motherhood. I want a lot of mothers, but I also want a dad. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, I don't want all mothers because I also want people who are single or who are debating if they even want children. Um, so we have that too. Uh, the, 
the book takes place in Ohio. I want to hire people from Ohio. Mm. I mean, it's just like those things, um, and and that's what we're gonna. I mean, that's what we're doing. So, so it's just a it's just a different. So let let me ask you and Rena. So have you ever been the only woman on a staff, and what was that dynamic like? Did you feel that you were there to were you heard? Were you rep were you there to represent all women's point of view? Were, you know, what I was, was I there like? I to represent all women. <laughs> <laughs> I'm and I, I did it well because I allowed, ma that was in a, I was a half hour room. I started, okay. in, I started in comedy and for, so historically, and I, I really can't speak to whether or not it's changed, but half hour rooms absolutely were the most brutal. Br I mean, most of the time there were no women for, the, I mean, Brutal in what way? Just, Brutal, just like, just like gross it's, a language, it's one or what? rape joke after another. Yeah. It's one. The showrunner on on that particular show where I was the only room, I, he was forced to hire me, um, and I was so I was paper teamed. He wanted I was a, I had just been promoted. I was a, had been a writer's assistant. The other guy that he wanted to hire had also been a writer's assistant. The studio said you you have to hire her because you need a woman, and his, he decided to make it a paper team instead, So, which is essentially you get paired up as if you're a writing team, so you're paid half, but you're a writer's assistant and it's your first job, so you don't care. You were a uh, paper team with a guy? or oh, with a, a guy. A guy? A guy, so, yes. So he was forced you're to like hire... half a woman. He was, <laughs> yeah. he, was, he was forced to hire a woman, and he said, I'll only hire I'll a woman, hire if, I a can, woman. <laughs> if I can hire with a guy. I'll hire okay, half so a lady. Okay, so that's interesting. Yeah. How long ago was that? This was, ooh, I'm old. This was in the 90s. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, but paper teaming still happens. I don't know if that particular happens, but that is something that the Writers Guild is, is against, but that is, is a practice that is still taking place in the industry. So go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, 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 no. Um, and so it was, I remember there was just, the, it's a, I imagine it's, I was not part of a sorority in college, but I, you would know about it. <laughs> Well, Greek, all the, but it, it was, hey, it's just a constant hazing. It was a constant level of naked pictures being drawn of me or questions about who I was sleeping with. Yeah, I mean, it was, pr and, but the, I mean, what was crazy is there were two showrunners. One of them is someone who I just, to this day, would lie down in front of a train for it because it, it, his poor job was literally constantly coming up to me going, are you okay? I'm really sorry. I'm like, I'm fine. I was really young and just so happy to be in the room. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I can't imagine that that happens now. And yet, that's stupid, right? Like, of course it happens. If it happens, I think, I think what happens now is, is so much more subtle. Because I, I do have a friend who is a lower level writer on a show just, just this past year. And put it this way. Every single woman on that staff quit. And it, you don't quit a writer's job. It's hard to get. Two of the writers who quit were like story editor level. By the end of the year, every woman left that show. And the studio did nothing. Acted like, well, we'll just, we'll just hire more women. Instead of saying, you have a problem. Every gal left. <laughs> you have a problem. <laughs> and they didn't care. So let me ask, so Patrick, Chris, so have, have you been in a room where you've been, you've seen, I mean, you were only in one room, so, so I, uh, you know, but were people represented in that room? Did you have an equal amount of women? Did you have people of color? I want to point out that we're a very white panel up here. <laughs> I want to point out that we're four guys and two women and we're discussing power dynamics in Hollywood. So we can have this conversation, but part of the problem is that we still are kind of falling into a typical bias. So that's not lost on me, so I really want to talk about what is our role as white guys in kind of challenging the system, because we do have power, and how do we hire people, and how do we bring them along, and how do we make some serious change? Ooh. Um, Hall and Catch Fire was a really interesting exercise in this because, you know, the show, the pilot was, was written, I think, in response to the end of that kind of anti-hero era in TV, the kind of Don Draper, Tony Soprano stuff, and, and the pilot was very much in that mold, uh, meant to emulate those shows. Uh, and over the course of the first season, you know, where 
only two of the eight writers in the room were female. It became this ensemble show that's that's very much about women in the workplace as much as it's about anything. It's you know that our cast is 50% female, and and we decided that going forward we needed to be at least 50% female in the writers' room and behind the camera. Uh, and this show, you know, improved exponentially. I think as a result, uh, that was a thing I wish we hadn't had to learn from experience. Um, but I will tell you the great tragedy of it was also the show takes place in 1983. I was born in 1983, so we wanted to get some people who had lived a little bit more of that life. I'm, I'm not happy to hear that either. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, when it was, so you, you, you know, send out to all the agencies and say, we're looking for some upper level female writers. We, we would like to, to meet some writers over a certain age uh, that, that have perhaps lived in some of these years we're trying to depict. Uh, and so you, you get some names, uh, and then we did it again the next year, and again the next year, and you get the same eight names every time, uh, because that category of writer is just so gutted from years of it being white guys hiring white guys, uh, that there is not this, you know, <laughs> at least the agencies don't want to send you a, a ready crop of kind of older female writers. I think it's getting a little better, uh, especially like you're hiring new writers, playwrights, you know, or people that just couldn't get jobs, people that were assistants, people uh, that come from outside the system. But I, the way the deck was stacked, I, I think, was, was really eye-opening to us. Mm -hmm. uh, just these can't be the only eight women in Hollywood that want to write TV. Uh, so we really had to kind of go outside the traditional agency channels to, to find people to fill those spots. And, you know, I'm happy to say we were able to achieve that 50% parity in the second season through the fourth. Uh, what, were, what were some of those other avenues you went? You went to smaller agencies or you, uh, how, how did you complete that search? Exactly. And just like friends of friends. Uh, we, we just kind of made it known we wanted. And so we, you know, we tried some playwrights. We, we tried some people who weren't as tested. We tried some people with bad reputations. And I think you got to inspect a bad reputation when it's like, she's difficult. Well, what does that mean? Why was she difficult? Was she in a difficult situation? Okay, uh, let's, let's talk about this. This is a big thing. Um, uh, Lexi Alexander is a director who just posted something called What Time Is It Hollywood on the Tempest? And she's talking about smear campaigns. And what I have found is that very often, if a woman is um, from, you know, speaking to, to uh, writers that I know, if a woman doesn't um, is in a, a sexist or misogynistic environment, um, showrunner's not going to say, I'm a misogynist, I fired her. She's going to say she didn't get the show. She didn't hang with the guy. She couldn't do this or whatever. And very often the studio and the network will then say, mm, we heard she's difficult, we heard this, that. So the woman ends up getting blackballed from entire studios or networks, and I've asked studio executives, and they said, oh yeah, we do do that, don't we? <laughs> so, you know, has that, you know, Liz, Rena, has that ever happened to you? Have you ever had that experience where you had a bad experience on a network or studio, and they're just not hiring you, and, you, and then you find out it's because of something, you know, what do you think? I haven't had that experience that I know of, um, but, um, but I think it's, I think part of it is because, and I mean, I obviously know Rena well and know uh, how, how nice she is. And I think, I think we're, but I also think like we've been conditioned to protect ourselves from that. You know, we know how to, way, we way. know how to be nice. We know how to be nice. We know how to be accommodating. Um, I think that... But isn't that saying that power is still with the male and you need yes. to be subordinate with the oh, male? Is oh, yeah, that no, what, it's not good saying. that we know this. Okay. I'm not saying this is good. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not complex. I mean, I'm just saying that we are so, it is so ingrained in us. I mean, I, I just had kind of a situation where I felt like, um, I felt like, uh, to no fault of the other writer, I felt like I wasn't getting... Um, the same, I'm not talking pay, but I'm talking structure of a deal that I really wanted, that was really fundamentally important to me to do a job. And I found myself so like challenged as, it, it the experience, it's funny, I, I didn't really understand, like I didn't feel like I fully appreciated the word triggered, <laughs> because I thought like, is that a high maintenance millennial word? And like, let's toughen up people, you know, because that, whatever. Um, and then I'm like, oh, 
Now I understand it because this must be how people feel when they fly into like a blind rage where they can't see anything and like their, their stomach hurts and their heart's beating and, and you feel so um, just deeply, whether it's offended or, or, or wounded or whatever it is. But, um, but it, was so, it was so hard for me and I kind of had to like track myself in the process of, of how hard it was to stand up and say like, I'm not going to do this then. Like, I, I don't want to do this. And if I have to lose the job, then I lose the job. But, um, and even when I felt that pressure of like, come on, this was given to you now, be happy. Or um, can't you just, it's not as bad as you thought it was going to be, so doesn't that feel better? Um, or, well, they clearly really want to work with you. They're not saying fuck off, so like, can you play ball? And I'm just kind of like, no, because it's just not right. Like, it, it's just not right. And it's, I mean, we've, ta we've talked about it, you know, and then you we go. Have we have lady hikes. We have that lady helps. hikes when we're like, it was so scary. I didn't we know encourage to lady hikes. <laughs> it's a really good way to get yeah. it out. It's, we, so, 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 so what's been, you, let me just ask Maria. So what's been your experience like this? Um, I, I, t I did have one person uh, after I worked there for an entire year say, I, could I get a refund on her salary because she didn't work out? And that, luckily, uh, I was, at that point, I was closer with the people at the studio than I was with that particular uh, person in charge, so they said no, and I was <laughs> gratified with that. Um, but I do think Liz is, is right. I mean, we both sort of came up under Greg Berlanti, who, and 100% for me, my entire career, I would say, is owed to him because it, when he was leaving, Ever, he was ready to move on from Everwood and he was wanting to hand me the show. And Peter Roth, who I adore and who did become one of my biggest advocates at the studio, at the time when Greg said that, was like, hell no. And it was, and it, he was trying to play it on the, well, she's young and she's this, but Greg had been given, Greg was running Dawson's by the time he was 26. So it's hard to argue that, well, you were okay to run a show at 26, but she's not okay to run a show at third. Like, it was all, it was all very shady, but it was, it, it, it is upon people, and, and you are very, like, famously wonderful among writers as someone who does this, but, like, it is incumbent upon having people who are willing to go to bat for you. And because even studio executives or network people who aren't necessarily bad, they're just, it's, it's complicated and thank God we don't have that job. But like, I, Greg stood up for me and said, well, she can, she's doing it. So that's what's happening. Um, yeah, just real quick, yeah. you know, what can the white guys do, right? It's, it's, it's a question of equal access. I think it doesn't mean having to elevate one person over the other because they're a woman or because they're Latino. It's it's equal access and and you know you you mentioned Lexi Alexander and I don't know if the audience sort of knows you know but I had a TV critic uh, who I was at an event and this critic sort of spoke to me and mentioned Lexi as someone who had maybe gotten this reputation that wasn't deserved and that she was being sort of blackballed at certain places. Now, one of my favorite musical artists is Billy Bragg, and, and he had a lyric in one of his songs that, you know, um, if you've got a blacklist, I want to be on it. And so I'm instantly intrigued by someone who's been blacklisted. And so I, I went out of my way to, um, to meet Lexi. I'd never met her. I'd never used her in the show. And so, you know, just... You know, and really like the meeting, and and I, I've she's going to direct an episode of SWAT for us. You know, this this next year, um, and these are the kinds of things that we can do. Is not I think it's something we learned from the whole Weinstein scandal that maybe there were actresses that he was bad mouth. You know, yeah. uh, there were some actresses that I'd always heard whispers. Oh, that actress is really difficult to work with, and and everything. And now I'm learning years later that oh, you know, perhaps. Um, you know, she was mistreated by Harvey Weinstein and then as a defense mechanism, you know, these rumors were put out there that I was just sort of accepting third hand as being real. We, we can't just accept the rumors. We've got to do our own research. We've got to find out our own things and, and, and give equal access. And, and the people who have talent, whether they're white, black, Latino, men, women, whatever, you know, if, if everyone has equal access, the, the talented will rise, I think. Patrick, do you want to say something? No, I, I, I think it's 
you know, it's I I I was staffing my show one season and there was a woman that I was interested in and uh, one of my partners was just like, no, I, I heard she's difficult. And it was, I was like, that's interesting because I haven't heard that. And it's just, you, you, when you're running a show, you're making so many decisions, like it gets so tired of just like another decision to make that you kind of can tend to take the easy way out. And just what Sean's saying, it's, it's do your research, do your due diligence and be thoughtful in all those decisions as opposed to just taking that one word and then moving on from that. Um, uh, we got the sign that uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Are there a couple of questions? I'm sure there might be something. So if we want to, you know, open it up for one or two quick questions, we could do that. Yes, go ahead. What makes for a good writer in a room? Well, it's an interesting question because you've added in a room. Because what makes a good writer isn't always the same thing that what makes a good writer in a room. Because the act of writing on your computer in isolation is different from collaborating with a group of people to, to arrive at a really good idea for a show. So you do need some people skills. You need to be able to read the room. You know, if I've objected to something, you know, if Glenn's the boss and I'm you know, a staff writer and he says something and I say, oh, but what if we did this? And he's like, I don't know. And then two minutes later, I'm like, well, we could, you know, maybe just think about doing this. And he says, no, it's probably not the greatest thing for me for a third time to say, what about, what about this? So you've got to read the room. Um, you've got to get along with people. Um, there have been writers that I haven't hired whose scripts I've loved where I'm just like, I, I don't know that I'm going to get along with that person in the room. I'm not sure that that person's going to be a good match with, with other writers. So, you know, can you be a good teammate? I would say, you know, are you going to be someone, you know, because you're spending eight, nine, 10, 11 hours a day with all these people. And, and can you, you know, be someone that doesn't drive people crazy? And if you can't, and you're an amazing writer, I had a writer uh, once who just, she, she did not like being in the room. It, was, it made her uncomfortable. She didn't like pitching. She was far, she turned in her first script, and I was like, I didn't have to, I barely had to touch it. And I went up to her and I'm like, do you just want to like write a shit ton of scripts this year? She's like, yes, yes. <laughs> I was like, fantastic. So it was like, you can't, I mean, you have to be, you have to be that, it's a, it's a like a once in a lifetime thing where you're like that perfect for that room. But, cause some people, it is, the rooms can be intimidating and, and we're writers so we're naturally, you know, not necessarily the most extroverted people. But um, but you can if your scripts and if your and if your love of the show if your love of the show is really coming through in the scripts and you can be honest with your showrunner and say now you can't just like be a dick and be like that person but if you're just not a big talker if you're afraid to pitch and you're just shy or have that thing I do think you can find that access and say I promise you it's going to come out on the page and sometimes if your boss is cool they'll they might be open. Yeah, and I would say just, you know, as a writer in a room, to be generous, to not make it about yourself. It's not about keeping score or winning your pitch or whatever. And to trust the process. You know, one of the things that you need to be free in a writer's room is you need to pitch a lot and you need to ha go through a lot of bad material. This stuff is hard to write. I mean, we all love TV. We've all seen thousands of hours of TV. You know, and it's hard to do something that surprises the audience and, and yet doesn't throw them too far out. You know, I mean, so it's, it's really difficult to come up with, with stories. And so trust the process, because we're going to pitch a lot of bad material. To, you have to sift through a lot of shit to get to the gold. Um, let's, let's just talk about one more thing, because I know uh, some of you said you came up as assistants. You know, and that's, that's really part of it, too. You know, yesterday with... You know, Anthony Bourdain, I was very um, upset to hear about that. But he always focused on the dishwashers and the line cooks. Who else is in the room? You know, who else has access to the room and, and who's coming up? And let's talk a little bit about the support staff. And obviously, I mean, everybody came up except not you. You weren't an assistant. You, you never got coffee for anybody. <laughs> but, well, but, but, let me, but, let me no. just. He's like 25. I don't know what's happening. I. I, I <laughs> <laughs> I didn't work as an assistant either, and I'm not saying this is the right path. In my mind, I didn't want anyone to view me as an assistant. I, now okay. I think that's wrong, but at the time, I was like, 
I found other jobs outside the industry that I could support myself while writing all these scripts. And, and frankly, there were jobs where I was only having to work like 30 hours a week, whereas when you're an assistant, you might be working 50, 60. And I questioned my ability to write scripts with that sort of job. I wanted to just, in that world, present myself <laughs> as a professional yeah. writer for hire. Um, although having said that, the people that I've given their first opportunities to write scripts have been assistants. Right. <laughs> everyone, and and so. there are shows, there are some, a lot of shows will bring people up as, because they know the culture of the show, but then some people don't want to hire assistants. I know showrunners who, who don't want that. But So what's been your experiences coming up through the, the farm system? I mean, I, like, like I said, I started out as a writer's PA, running scripts all over the universe a lot, and then as a writer's assistant, uh, the script coordinator is also another really important job that puts you there, uh, uh, close to the producers, and, and you know, it, when you're in those positions, you're wanting to, and you're in the room, you want to contribute uh, creatively to show your worth, but at the same time, you're the lowest man on the totem pole. So there was one time I remember I was like, taking notes and I was typing too loud. And I got in trouble from a producer who was like, must you type? It's my job. Yeah, I do. But I'll, I'll go to court reporter school or something. I don't know. <clears throat> um, so it's, but it, you know, there's that hazing too and some of it's in good fun and some of it I think you just kind of roll with it. And, um, but but it, it, it gets you right in the room. You're there for the creative process. You're observing so much and I think I got to work with a lot of amazing people, and it, I, I credit my success of running Greek because I learned from so many people on the way up. Okay, and and writers assistant pay, pays incredibly well. So much, <laughs> so much. Okay, but 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 people do it for access. When to you get the work. freelance episode, it yeah, does. Yeah, yeah. yeah that is, that's but the but one. but you do it. Go ahead, Chris. Well, I would just I would just say as a note of hopefulness, I I think I'm symptomatic of the. Uh, there are so many more people buying TV shows, buying so many more TV shows now. Uh, so just getting a job as a writer's assistant, which is fucking impossible if you didn't go to an Ivy League school or know somebody whose cousin is on the staff, isn't the only way to be a writer anymore. And I think that's great. I, I think there are a lot of buyers out there that are willing to take a shot at, at somebody's new idea. Yes, they may pair you with a more veteran person, but. I, I think the days of that being the singular path into a writer's room are, are ending, and I think that's a really happy thing that be, because it is very narrow. Those jobs are, you know, they're not going to show up on job boards. And for those of us that, that didn't come from kind of established school pathways or, or, or family networks, breaking in is, I think, the single hardest thing to do. So uh, I, I think that should inspire hope in people that want to write original material. If you, if you have a great idea, if you can make yourself valuable to it once it's got somebody's attention, then it's just about riding the bear and, and, and kind of keeping yourself in the room. And, and I, think that's, I think that's a hopeful good thing uh, in the industry now that, that's changing. Okay, perfect. Let's end on that note. So I want to thank our panel here. And thank you for coming. Hope you enjoy that. Thank you.